Good evening, hashtag my global family. This is Drea Beta, coyote walking in this world and real life is Leto Pueblo superhero. Also CEO of the International Abeta Consulting Group. We are proud to present this evening, this panel to, le to learn about the lived experiences of the fellow warriors here at UNM. We are here for hashtag local superheroes, necessary voices of UNM graduate student union organizers. Tonight, family, I hope you are ready to hear the hard truths of what it means to be a revolutionary in graduate school. I, before we get started though, I would like to take a moment for us to do our indigenous land acknowledgement. You know that this coyote is a real life Asleto Pueblo superhero and we are indigenous ground. We are always here to make sure that we reclaim the space and that we truly acknowledge the costs of coloniality and white supremacy that still affect all of our worlds today. So dear family, as I light this bundle and we remember the ground upon which we stand, every tradition and culture around the world has some sort of cleansing ceremony. And dear family, as we walk the path of our ancestors and we remember all the sacrifices that everyone made so that we may be here today in 2021 to survive and thrive, please give us the strength because the members on this panel, dear ancestors, hi Gammy and Papa and all of the revolutionaries and leaders who've gone before us, give your blessings to the people on this panel because they are our modern day superheroes and warriors who give of themselves their time, their dedication, and literally represent the voice so that all of the students, not only at the University of New Mexico, but at colleges and universities around the world have a fighting chance to make sure that they receive the degrees necessary to transform all of our lives and uplift all of our communities. Dear family, at this time, we are gonna take a moment to reflect upon one of our fallen warriors. Our amazing sister, Glenda Lewis, passed on this Monday. And she was one of our true revolutionaries. And she led UNM as a outspoken warrior and sister of my heart. She literally transformed every single life that she touched. Glenda Lewis, PhD in the Language, Literacy and Social Cultural Studies Department, I am proud to say was one of my heroes. She was a critical race theory and international, intersectional scholar. She was so interested in colorblind ideology and art and music, and she was going to change the world. But you know what family, she did. She did it by talking to all of the community members, by representing all of our issues. She was a former UNM DPSA president and led the Project for New Mexico graduates of color for countless years. On November 18th, I'm going to leave you with her words. She says, I do not recognize the divide that we have right now, but everyone has a personally relevant issue that should connect them. So right now there's no time to be divisive it's time to get to work. We have to push New Mexico and push America forward. At this time, family, please bow your heads and take a moment of silence to honor her amazing contributions. As we remember our dear sister Glenda, we are going to push forward family because the issues that we are going to speak on tonight affect all of our lives. And I mean that literally. Even if you are not currently a graduate student or a student at a college or university, you know a family member who is hopeful or is a recent graduate. These are centers of education and empowerment for all of us and the amazing revolutionaries here on this panel 
are sacrificing their everyday lives to make sure that our students have the ability to have safety and security for their families, a living wage that makes sense, an ability to do research and academic work and teaching in an environment that is not oppressive, and literally safety from sexual harassment, from the pressures of COVID, from not having enough resources at their disposal because they are underpaid family. We are underpaid. So I would like to welcome our amazing panelists and they are going to introduce themselves one by one. Thank you guys so much. And let me figure out technology. Our first speaker this evening is the amazing warrior, Kelsey Trevino. Hello, thank you for inviting me. My name is Kelsey Trevino and I'm a first year PhD student in Hispanic linguistics at the uh, Department of Spanish and Portuguese. And I'm also a um, organizing committee member at the union, um, the United Graduate Workers Union. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our second amazing speaker is Marley Russell. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you so much, Dre, for organizing this. My name is Marley. I am a fifth year PhD student in the psych department at UNM. Sorry, I heard a thing in the background. Um, I'm a fifth year PhD student at uh, in the psych department at UNM and also an organizing committee member. Um, and yeah, I'm super excited to talk about these issues. Our third amazing panel member. Oh, excuse me, family. Our third Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Aaron Moore. I'm a graduate student in the Community and Regional Planning Department, um, and I'm a member of UGW as well, um, with the Solidarity Committee and uh, general organizing efforts. Uh, happy to be here. Thank you so much, Dre. Thank you so much. I am the fourth panelist family. I am Drea Beta, coyote walking in this world, and I am proud to have been more active with the student union organizing last summer, but I am also very happy to be able to be one of the amazing students who is representing Student Voice. We also have two amazing community members who are part of our audience at this time. I'd like for you guys to just say a quick hello, if you'd like. Hi everyone, this is Nubia. Valentina? That's okay. All right, we are gonna go ahead and get started family and we are back to our amazing warrior sister, Kelsey. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to share a little bit about my story, kind of um, why I joined the union in the first place. Um, basically, uh, I've suffered kind of some of the things that a lot of my um, other colleagues have suffered, such as um, not being uh, able to access um, dental care and um, being able to access uh, visual care. Um, for example, this pair of glasses I've had for the last, um, I want to say three or four years, um, my eyesight is absolutely horrible. Um, I'm also missing teeth because I did not have access to dental care for a long time because uh, the university did not provide it for me. But one of the biggest reasons that I'm um, joining this fight and have been joined in this fight was because of how my colleagues have been treated in um, the department that I've been working in, um, not at UNM, but at CU Boulder, um, but this is a problem here at UNM as well. Um, I've seen my colleagues being treated um, at uh, horribly um, by professors, either by being retaliated against, um, either being by um, uh, bullied, um, I've seen a lot of things that have hurt my feelings through just my colleagues being hurt. And the main reason that I've joined this was um, to find security for other people that I work with. And that's one of the most, that's one of the main reason I've joined the union. Thank you very much. Now we're going to hear from Marley. 
Thank you. Um, I can pretty much second everything that Kelsey said. Um, I think a lot of us share the opinion that we're here to work for others. Um, in addition, of course, you know, to ourselves. Um, but you know, I definitely haven't uh, had the shortest end of the stick in terms of treatment. Um, as an international student, I have faced a lot of issues. I'm from Canada. Um, we, you know, experience issues such as not being able to take medical leave, um, the same issues that Kelsey mentioned, you know, not being able to afford dental, not being able to afford vision. I also have four to five year old glasses um, that are really scratched up because I can't afford an eye exam. Um, and international students do face a lot of specific issues as well. But my most primary motivation really is um, what I've seen happen to, you know, of course myself, but also lots of other people. Um, and specifically colleagues that um, didn't feel comfortable standing up for themselves and need to find a voice in a collective like we have going right now. Um, and yeah, I mean, we need, we definitely need better healthcare, um, but we also need things like, um, you know, a system whereby we can engage with faculty and admin that allow us to air these grievances in a way that's putting us on equal footing, um, that allows us to, like Kelsey mentioned, go through grievances without having re experiencing retaliation. Um, and yeah, so, so all of these issues really culminate, I believe, in um, a requirement for a collective voice um, and a requirement to be on the same footing as admin um, to be able to communicate, you know, on equal levels. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I am going to uh, just introduce you. Um, now we are going to be hearing from our amazing brother, Aaron. Yeah, I want, I want to uh, reiterate a lot of things Marley said, right? The, the, what a union is and the power that it has is the collective voice. Um, and, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of conditions that we face. <laughs> I was, I was just laughing because my glasses always are falling off my face and I can barely see out of them and I want to go get an eye exam so bad. Um, but yeah, that's a big, that's a big amount of my wage. And it's, you know, it's to, to do that. So that is a real issue. Um, other than that, I've definitely, you know, seen and been convinced of the power of unions ever since I was a kid. Uh, so uh, I am so glad that to be able to take part uh, in the union. And I'm glad that it's happening at, with us at a student level. It seems like a really um, powerful place to do it. There's a lot of energy that students have and uh, desire to embark on uh, world changing projects that's uh, really refreshing to be around. Um, and yeah, I mean, Marley said so much good stuff. You know, I wanna just like re almost repeat some of what she said, right? That just, these networks of, of collectives that uh, is what the union is so that that in lifting up our struggles we are able to form a network to to try to try and uplift struggles for people in all sorts of different places um i think that's it for now thanks thank you so much all right family so it's this coyote's turn and it's been a huge journey, family. So I started organizing because I had some amazing brothers who were on the ground um, and asked me to get involved about a year and a half ago. So right before COVID hit, oh, nope, never mind. <laughs> Time flies. So I'd say last February, family. So I guess that's not a year and a half ago. Um, I had been one of the UNM GPSA leaders at UNM, and I had been fighting for student rights based on sexual harassment and hostile work environments. Um, so unfortunately, I was a survivor of a predatory academic relationship. I am an indigenous scholar and warrior for the Pueblo of Asleta. And unfortunately, because of the power differential, a white male tenured professor decided to take advantage of his female students. He created a cult-like environment, which literally triggered he as a person triggered my PTSD episodes on purpose to punish me. And I was literally in a cult-like environment family. And that is traumatizing and saying something because in academia, your entire livelihood is basically based on whether or not your advisor is gonna give you a recommendation letter. 
If you literally have dreams of becoming a professor or a lecturer or a researcher, you have to have the recommendation of your advisor. If not, you're literally, mm, what is wrong with them if they don't have a letter from this, that, or the other? That's an immense amount of power, family. And this person literally becomes a figurative god. In addition to that, I realized that he was using the parties and the public events like speakers to recruit sexual favors from students' family. So I want you to think about that. We've heard all of the stories and I wish it was something from a bygone era of the 1950s when my mother is telling me about sexual harassment that was happening at the university at the time. Unfortunately, those stories are alive and well and he was preying upon female students in my group family. And that means that there is young, impressionable, and actually all ages, because I am 40 years old, and I believed everything that was coming out of this academic professor's mouth. So my publications, my conferences, every door that opened academia for me over the last four years came because of his introduction. So I want you to think family, in college, you have these spaces where you can't make it unless the person in power likes you and what kind of predatory environment that creates because you're not creating an environment of learning and support you're creating a survival of the fittest and literally a scenario where students try to tear themselves apart in order to make good in front of the professor or they end up in a situation that is emotionally draining or physically draining to themselves because now they're in a predatory relationship. So our advisor used us to fulfill an emotional need in a predatory way. Now, when I was sharing my story, because I was suicidal after this, how could I be a student leader and a revolutionary if I allowed this person to have power over me and allowed him to hurt the people around me? So I was in my deepest, darkest moments, family, and I was suicidal three years ago. And I told my department and I told my other professors and I went to the office of OEO and I asked for help. And I said that this person is hurting us. And I was cornered and told that that would never happen to anyone else. Even though there were multiple cases on file by this particular predator. So unfortunately, family, when you are up against an institution like the University of New Mexico, it is only there to protect itself. It is a self-perpetuating system that is eating up our students and throwing them out. And we have no security via job. We have no security emotionally. We have no security when it comes to our ability to pay our bills, feed our family, and put our own children into school. So when I'm sharing my heartbreak and how I almost killed myself because the university allowed someone to abuse me, I found more stories, family. And I represented those students on one-on-one -on -one meetings with UNM. And that's why this group is so powerful. And that's why union organizing is so powerful because individually they can corner us and they can say, it's you who's crazy. It's this only situation and you're the problem, not the systemic issues that are based on race and based on wealth and based on citizenship and based on language and based on the white supremacist structure that is academia. I want you to know family that you are not alone. If your professor has abused you or used your work or stolen your work, because in my three and a half years as a UNM leader, students came to me and said, this professor stole my work. Students came to me in their GA ships and said, I have to do this many hours of research on top of publications because our professors are including predatory behavior which is taking students work and getting a co-authorship on every single publication they have which means that in fields like engineering where my a beautiful family has also come from 
I have reported abuses stories from UNM in which those students, some were which more vulnerable, we're gonna talk about international students, they were literally turned into paper mills. And this professor who gets millions of dollars in grants to the university becomes untouchable, but harasses their student to the point that after the student had graduated, they literally had panic attacks and had to change all of their contact information. That's on the regular family. There's no job security. They're using us as paper mails. They're stealing our academic work. And we have been railing and asking and begging. And now we're at the point where we are demanding that they listen to us because collectively they have been throwing the legal teams at us. They've been throwing media at us. And when you are student organizers facing a billion dollar institution, that is Goliath and David all over again. And that's why we need your help family. We need your support and you need to go to the website. You need to sign the petition cards and you need to tell everyone you know that what is going on at UNM will not stand. That you will not allow them to continue to abuse us because everything that comes out of that university is on the backs of the graduate students and all of their student workers. Another story that I advocated for is our international students are incredibly vulnerable. They do not have the same protections. And if they're coming from places like Indonesia, Madagascar, Ghana, they cannot afford out-of-state tuition. As a graduate student, you get in-state tuition. One of my many brothers and sisters from around the world at UNM went home like every graduate student should and did their research and had a job, did their research and came back and the department's response was, I'm sorry, your opportunity is gone. And literally put that entire program, that entire person's entire PhD at risk because they no longer had a job because UNM doesn't see people. They see numbers and they see commodities to be bought and sold and why do our graduate students make $750 for every course that they teach? When how much does a professor make at 75,000 if you're in a poor college like education or 250,000 if you're in a rich one like engineering? So dear family, I'm asking you, when our brothers and sisters who are graduate students can't feed their families or even afford the ghetto that is graduate student housing that will be closed at the end of this year during a global pandemic. Our graduate students can't even rely on graduate student housing because UNM says 55 million is too much to spend on our lives, on our safety and our security. So why do my brothers and sisters who live there now have to be at risk of asbestos, having no internet connection or their children literally living in fear because they might get broken into with no or little security. So I'm asking you family, they have no health security. They have no job security. I keep saying them, I am one of them. But you know that I'm a princess, which I talk about intersectionality, but I'm not talking about something that's gonna go away. I'm talking about something that's affecting all of their lives now. So please do something different. If you are an employee, if you're a staff member, if you're an alumni, if you're a student, if you're a community member, if you're a human being with a beating heart, I want you to email President Stokes and I want you to tell them that you stand with UNM grad workers because we are employees. At this moment, we are going to open it up to the question and answer part. Our first question for this evening is why are graduate student workers at Union UNM organizing a union? Who would like to address that? Um, I can take this question if everybody's okay with that. Oh, um, this is Kelsey. Sorry. Um, so just like uh, Dre said, um, and all those things that she mentioned uh, occurs on campus and um, they occur frequently. And um, one of the things that uh, we are having a problem with is 
that there's no good recourse uh, for solving those issues and actually holding those people accountable. A lot of the time, whenever you go to uh, report activities like this or report a professor for doing something like this, nothing happens. A lot of times it gets um, swept under the rug. Um, these things happen all the time. And uh, a lot of people have been joining the union to kind of um, find a way to hold these people accountable, um, at least find a better way. Um, another thing is obviously something that we've talked about is having better uh, dental and visual or uh, vision care. Um, one of the things that we talk about a lot is that we are graduate workers and um, we do use our body to do that work and we um, spend our lives um, using our bodies to work and we expend our bodies to do that. So meaning we look at a computer all day, uh, meaning we sit at, uh, at a chair all day um, and we do get used up, our bodies do get used up using that. So we should be afforded the same medical care, same vision and same dental as everyone else that works for the university. The other thing is, is that um, the wages that we are given um, do not match those of the cost of living in Albuquerque. Uh, we are actually given poverty wages um, for graduate students. Um, we are, a lot of graduate students are not allowed to work outside the university. Um, we are allowed uh, 20 hours a week. Um, so we're able to get what we can from the university, but we're usually not able to get another job and make extra wages. Um, therefore, uh, we are just always living below this poverty line and it is um, quite frustrating. Uh, it seems like they don't want to give us more money and they don't want us to they don't want to allow us to work more um so like we've said in the union you can't have your cake and eat it too so uh, the other thing is like dre mentioned is that uh, the international students are um uh marginalized quite a bit uh, by unm seeing that they are um they are treated differently. Everybody saw at the beginning of last semester when an edict came out that uh, the uh, international students were having to um, do everything online. They weren't able to um, come to the university. Everyone had to go home. And then that changed later. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty going on with international students. And that's another thing that we would like to allow protection for. Um, and then the last thing, um, like Dre said, uh, there's a, there was a lot of talk about the graduate student uh, buildings, the housing. Um, like she said, one of those buildings is currently being condemned because it has asbestos in it. So um, just food for thought, food for thought um, UNM had a building that had asbestos in it um, and it's condemned. And this were the conditions that graduate students were living in. So those are not exhaustive reasons for the fight that we're having with UNM or why we decided to uh, make a graduate union. Um, and a lot of it has to do with uh, it being the right place on the right time. Uh, COVID seems to seem to bring everybody together. I mean, we were able to uh, connect pretty easily over Zoom. Um, Surprisingly, everybody thought it was going to bring us the farther apart, but it seemed like we were able to organize very easily over Zoom and uh, our organization effort has been um, amazing. And uh, this, you know, this whole thing with COVID and everything happening with the elections and uh, it just seemed like it was the right thing to do and it was the right time. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Our second question today is, uh, oh, I'm sorry, before I continue, does anyone, would anyone like to um, address that? Um, sure, I'll just, I, I'll add a little bit, um, just that, you know, I mean, there's a real sense that we're really tired of and not really willing to feel like the university is a lost cause, um, that we are not really willing to like give over to the idea or the possibility that the university is totally aligned with uh, some sort of economic or profit maximization principle in all of its 
uh, manifestations and all the different ways that it articulates itself. Uh, and this, I mean, it seems it's gone pretty far down this path of aligning itself away from an enrichment of the human spirit and the, uh, you know, spirit of the world in, in many different forms into a, a fairly directly, you know, kind of economic profit logic uh, in that what is most expedient is what will make the most money and things like this. And it becomes a bottom line. And I think it, it shows in places like when Jay was talking about the need to continue business as usual, despite what was going on, what was important for the university was product, right? Was was business as usual. Like we got it, we got to keep doing this. Like we cannot back away. And and like that's like that's that's hard to deal with. That's and I don't think that that's part of the thing is that you, we weren't willing to do to accept that this is the fate of the university. There's a possibility that I think is alive in all of us who are at the university maybe that of a chance for enrichment of the human spirit. And, I'm, and I, I say human spirit, but I really wanna think about like the human and the spirit. <laughs> that there's a chance for, you know, an enrichment of these, these things. Um, so, yeah. So I just wanna say that, it, it, you know, I'm sometimes like, I, like it's it's gone pretty far down a path, it seems like where of this um, kind of logic, but I don't think we're willing to let it go yet. So that was my piece, thanks. Thank you so much. Our second question this evening is what are some of the most pressing, pressing issues that grad student workers are facing as UNM employees? So Kelsey touched on a lot of them, um, but I will follow up with a couple others and maybe follow up on some of the ones she already touched on. Um, so, you know, of course, number one always seems to be that, like Kelsey mentioned, we make, we make under, you know, poverty wages. We cannot afford to live given the cost of living in Albuquerque. It's just simple math, you know? Um, and of course that compounds the issues that we have with not having the best health insurance, not having dental and optical coverage. Um, and honestly, our health insurance, another thing I'll mention, um, is, not great for any sort of uh, transgender related or gender affirming care. Um, so that's another thing that tends to compound um, in individuals who are, you know, even more marginalized. And, um, but aside from the stuff that Kelsey mentioned, you know, a lot of us are heavily overworked. And again, that's another compounding issue, you know, that makes it even more difficult because if we can't afford to live and we're already overworked, you know, beyond the 20 hours that we're getting paid to work, um, how on earth are we going to, you know, get a second or third job that will allow us to bring our wages up to the level where we can afford rent, food, healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is even worse for grad students with children. Um, I don't have children myself, but childcare is not affordable. Um, UNM doesn't provide adequate childcare from what I've heard from, you know, individuals that do have children. Um, and other, you know, more generally, one of the most pressing issues is that um, there's large power imbalances that there's no manner of really rectifying um, when a faculty or an admin is taking advantage of that power imbalance. You know, um, departments might have specific grievance procedures, but not all departments, or at least from my knowledge, um, it doesn't seem like all departments do have explicitly outlined grievance procedures. And if they do, they don't work, they don't tend to work. Um, a lot of grad students feel like there's no point in going through the grievance procedures because they do get retaliated against or nothing happens regardless. And like someone else mentioned, it's swept under the rug. Um, and, and yeah, I think either Aaron or Kelsey mentioned that COVID kind of exasper exacerbated or I suppose um, emboldened a lot of uh, grad students because of the increasing issues that we were facing. So you know, a lot of us didn't have a say in how we were going to teach, where we were going to do research, um, and whether we were going to be safe from COVID. Um, you know, I've heard stories of grad workers being forced to come in to do research assistantships, to teach in person, despite being at high COVID-related mortality risk. Um, and we just didn't have a say. And that, like, brings us back to the overarching issue, which is that there is a power imbalance between grad workers and admin. 
And without, um, you know, a bargaining table that we can sit down at together, um, we are never going to have a real say in, um, in all of these, in, you know, what, when we teach, where we teach, uh, whether we teach in person, um, or any of the other issues I mentioned. Um, and, and yeah, that's, I, I think someone else jump in if I've missed any major issues, but I think when it really comes down to it, all these issues really touch on an overarching issue of inequity. Um, grad students, you know, there's no formalized manner of correcting inequity. Um, and that means that we're missing a lot of really critical voices because particular grad workers are heavily overworked, are heavily underpaid um, and don't have the ability, or even if they did, maybe they don't have the energy um, to, to deal with these issues or to help others deal with these issues. Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, oh, sorry. I'll, just, I'll just follow up that is, you know, it gets down to that uh, graduate students really are an integral part of the functioning of the university. And yet we're treated with the very like least amount of regard possible so that the very most amount of profit can be extracted from our, and I use profit in a, in a kind of wide sense, not just monetary here, but basically falling back into a sort of economic uh, logic, I think so. I mean, not to beat a dead horse, but just to jump on that, one of the manuscripts I'm currently working on is talking about the inequality of the impossible dream of higher education in 2021. Um, to be completely honest, I've been doing this for eight and a half years, and I have lost more than half of my cohort. And economics had a lot to do with it. If you weren't independently wealthy and able to pay your own bills during COVID and you lost a class because the course didn't make, you were SOL, or you were basically hopeful that the unemployment that you're receiving is going to help cover the bills. When we really look at it, family, Americans believe that higher education is an easily attainable dream. And we have 100,000 plus dollars of debt if you go after something like a PhD and you have to take out loans. So I'm asking you, is it really something that anyone can do or do you have to be independently wealthy in order to make it work? Because right now the average person can't live off of the slave wages that the university is currently giving us. Now we all have fantasy stories, right? But I want you to think about Charles Dickens. Academia and education was not meant for the poor. And that is what the majority of Americans are, is working poor. And I talk about intersectionality and inherited wealth, which I am as a second year college graduate family, but that is not the reality. When I can't pay my bills, I'm lucky enough to have a parent who can literally help me and an Ivy League graduate husband who's a second generation college graduate who can pay the bills. That is impossible. I'm one in a million. And that means that every other person out there who is a human person who believes that it's just as easy as going out there and getting a college degree is being sold a bag of goods. And we need to rip that apart family. And we need to look at the hard reality of what UNM is literally doing to our family. Because this are our brothers and sisters. These are our community leaders, our educators. They're literally the people that UNM is profiting off of. So we can pay the president $400,000 and all of these deans, $200,000 each, and these professors and coaches, and literally spend hundreds of thousands of dollars bailing them out of bad business deals. Then why can't we pay our workers a living wage? Our third question today, goes again back to power differentials and how a massive university with lawyers and billions of dollars of resources to call upon can literally try to take out student voice. The third question today, why did UNM petition the labor board even after a supermajority of grad workers signed the union cards? You know, I think this is a really good question. Uh, and it's a question I think a lot of us in the union have been asking ourselves, uh, why did the university do this? In, in most sort of, of an, frames of analysis, you it wouldn't seem to make sense. Um, the only frame that I can make sense of it in 
is if I think about that the university has, um, no, it's tough. It's just like, it doesn't make sense on any sort of like humanistic or, or intellectual kind of level. Uh, it may, it doesn't make sense. It only makes sense on a sort of like economic, like neoliberal capitalist sort of logic. That's the only kind of way that I've been able to make sense of it. I don't know what, what you all think, Marley and Kelsey. I think one way of putting it um, really simply is that they don't want to bargain with us and they don't want to talk to us and they don't want to be on equal footing with us because we've given them the opportunity to to provide that um, without, you know, before unionizing, it's not like we unionized overnight. So I think at this point or at some point, what a lot of grad workers realize is that if they were going to bargain in good faith with us or just listen to us to begin with, um, they would have, you know, it's not like we're going to deny that opportunity to them. We would love that. And so um, I think probably the most simple answer is that they, they're not going to bargain with us unless they absolutely have to. And so they want to use all the resources that they see that they have to prevent that from happening. Yeah, and I'll add on to what Marley said. I mean, the reason that they're going to try and get this petition or they tried to get this petition dismissed is that, you know, they think that they can win in court or against us in this, um, this hearing, and they don't want to pay any more than they have to. Um, so, I mean, it goes back again to thinking of the university as a business, you know, they, they are, you know, still in this capitalistic mindset of, you know, we don't need to pay our workers more than we have to. Um, they don't do uh, the kind of work that our professors do. And the thing is, is that, you know, we've looked into it, you know, we have the, the, the numbers, we have the value and like, you know, they, graduate students run the school, graduate workers, uh, we add, you know, millions and millions of dollars of value to uh, the university and what they're proposing uh, that we are not um, employees is just absolutely wrong and preposterous. And just to clarify, that's literally the argument family. UNM is submitted a petition to ask the labor board to dismiss everything based on the fact that they claim the UNM grad workers aren't employees. Think about that family, UNM grad workers aren't employees. That's our capitalist system right now that does not protect you as an individual, but rather protects the entire institution. Our fourth question today, what does the labor board hearing mean for us and the state of labor relations in the state of New Mexico long-term? Well, you know, this is a historic, um decision being made. It's the first time that, that grad workers have tried to organize in New Mexico, and it's the first time this decision has come before the labor board for grad workers. Um, so the labor board is weighing the option in consideration of the fact that this sets precedent for, for uh, generations to come. I'll add that um, Aaron's right. This, you know, sets a lot of precedent, but in terms of what it means for, um, for us as a union, I will go out and say that I think honestly, most of us agree that it doesn't mean much regardless of the outcome of the hearing. Like we were unionized, we have a union, um, we're here to stay. It, I mean, of course we would love to be able to go through um, the, you know, what's the word? Um, predetermined legal pathways for bargaining. But if, you know, if on the off chance we don't win this hearing, we're still a union and we're still going to be bargaining with the university in our own way. That's right. And, this, you know, it creates a really interesting thing um, because that's exactly right. It's a choice that the university has about whether to work with us in a productive manner or in a conflictual manner. And what they're deciding is that it's more profitable for them to hire outside lawyers to attack us and to force us into a path of conflictual uh, bargaining as opposed to collaboratory bargaining around a bargaining table, which is really unfortunate. And then, so Marley hit it on the head and so it doesn't mean much. I mean, we're a union, we're here to stay. This in a lot, 
it in the courts it's uh it is a, a precedent setting thing but it's perfunctory in a lot of ways because yeah we're pretty solid right on marley yeah and i just want to add on to both of what they're saying um and also give like a perspective as far as like the big picture um, across the United States, there's been a surge in strikes and um, graduate unions forming. Uh, just this past two weeks, Columbia University has been striking and they formed a union uh, earlier on this year. Um, and they've been, uh, they've been striking the last two weeks. And um, there's also been several other universities that have done so. So I would like to reiterate that the problems that we're facing at UNM is not something that is necessarily special to UNM, but this is something that is a toxic um, cultural thing that is happening amongst all universities. And I think us taking a stand towards that is really connecting to that uh, shift in uh, the way that we're going to start seeing universities and the way that our relationships are going to start forming uh, with students and admin. So um, that's going to be uh, something to look forward to in the future. And the last scheduled question we have the evening before we open it up to our community audience and final comments is what are we looking at for the future? What is our hope? What are our strategies? And dear audience, what can we ask you to do to help us? Dear panel, who would like to tackle that one? I mean, I'll mention a couple just specific things off the top of my head. I mean, one thing is, you know, we have a petition right now that's asking, that we're asking everyone to sign. All community members are welcome and very encouraged to sign. Um, that, you know, is asking UNM to basically drop this whole charade and, you know, just recognize us as a union like we deserve to be recognized. Um, that's number one. I'll let someone else jump in. Let me go ahead and just share that site with you guys, with you, dear family. Here is the website with our petition. It is unmgrads.ueunion.org. And while we're on the website, I will just mention if anyone's watching and hasn't signed a union card, go ahead and go to that same website and sign a union card. Yeah, and, and come to our, our organizing committee meetings. They happen on Fridays at 4 p.m. Um, and we should, there, is there an email that address that they could send uh, inquiries about that too yeah i'll put well i know that jenna still sends out the um the zoom link so i'll put her her email in the chat at this time i would like to go ahead and open this to our community audience does anyone in our audience would they like to have a question or a comment to add Not at this time. Thank you all so much. And just a reminder, Jenna Dole is going to be the contact via email. And that is jdole, D-O-L-E, at unm.edu. I'm gonna go ahead and open up to the panel for their last comments before Kelsey has the last word. Thank you so much for having us, Jay. It's, it's really nice to get an opportunity to talk about the union and to uplift the efforts that we are embarking on here. Um, it, this is an awesome effort in the state of New Mexico. Uh, we're really happy to be working with UE unions uh, in our organizing efforts. Uh, so many thanks for their help. Uh, you know, we, this, is our, uh, this is an effort that got started a number of years ago and, and has organized with IWW quite a bit. And I know that there's much appreciation for their guidance in the early years of the formation too. Um, and what else did I want to say that, um, yeah, that we look forward to seeing some of y'all at our meetings and, and talking with you and, 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 and working on making things a little better. 
I think all of us forgot to mention, I should mention as well, if you're a grad worker, another ask that we're um, looking for right now is take our bargaining survey. And what that survey does is it's, um, we're collecting data on what issues are most important to grad students. You know, the three of us and the organizing committee in general are not um, the voice of the union. We're all the voice of the union. So if you haven't filled out a bargaining survey yet, please do that. Um, and yeah, in closing, I would just like to thank Dre so much. Um, thank you, Dre, for sharing your personal experience, you know, to kind of um, augment the collective experience and the collective voice that we are trying to uh, get out there. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, everyone. I appreciate all of your efforts. We are going to go ahead and end with Kelsey having the last word. All right. Uh, I just wanted to echo what my colleagues say and just thank Dre for having us on here. We really appreciate us, uh, you giving us a voice and uh, giving us some space to talk about the union and some of our efforts. Um, I just wanted to say it's it's great being a part of something um, so big and uh, something that you can really feel uh, change um, change the way that we are um, doing things at the university and it's it's really important work. And um, I really encourage anybody who wants to get involved, please do that. Um, anybody that wants to follow us on Instagram, F Facebook, or Twitter, please follow us at, at UNM Brad Workers. And that's the same for all three of those. And again, thank you so much for your time. <laughs>